Uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this Global Homeschool Leaders Panel. Uh, this call, uh, this panel is organized by the Global Home Education Exchange, uh, which has the purpose of connecting and equipping homeschool leaders and advocates around the world. Our purpose uh, today is to help uh, uh, our societies grapple with a sudden educational shift uh, toward homeschooling during these trying times. We never imagined the situation that we're in where we currently have hundreds of millions of families that are experiencing the joys and the challenges that homeschooling uh, as a community embraces regularly. Uh, we as homeschool leaders want to help our policymakers and parents grapple with this new normal. The homeschool community we know from our experience can help and that's our purpose for our discussion here today. I want to start by welcoming our panelists from around the world uh, as they uh, share with you uh, the experience uh, and, the, and the struggles that they've been involved in. Uh, we uh, want to have a two-way discussion and we'll have a discussion time at the end of the presentations and uh, look forward to your, your participation and your input uh, throughout this panel. Uh, to begin, uh, I'd like to, uh, to ask for welcome com welcoming comments from uh, the Minister or the Secretary of Education from the United States of America, uh, Betsy DeVos. Uh, Betsy is the 11th Secretary of Education and uh, she works hard uh, in that, that capacity in uh, dealing with educational reform and educational freedoms across the United States. Uh, Betsy DeVos uh, is, the, is a mother of four children and, eight, and a grandmother of eight grandchildren and has extensive experience uh, from her time uh, in education at a number of levels. Uh, you can read her uh, bio in more detail uh, on the website, uh, but what I'll ask is because Betsy DeVos is not able to be here in person, she has provided uh, comments, and I'll ask uh, Deborah Bell, who's the Vice Chair of the Global Home Education Exchange Council to, uh, to relay those, those comments. Deborah, please. Thank you, Gerald. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just pass along that Secretary DeVos wanted everyone to know she wishes she could be here with us in person, but because of the response to the pandemic, she's unable to join us. Here are her remarks. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you today, but please let me offer a few words of acknowledgement and gratitude for what homeschool leaders and parents do for students every day, especially now. The challenges we face right now are extraordinary. For our part at the U.S. Department of Education, we are speedily responding to what local education leaders need so they can do the next right thing for their students. We are implementing President Trump's plan to provide relief to our nation's students, their families, America's workers, and businesses through the CARES Act. We are working with Congress on extending funding flexibility to states and local education leaders to come alongside them as they address unique challenges resulting from this pandemic. As all of you at the Global Home Education Exchange know, many parents across the country have suddenly become homeschoolers. Parents are our first teachers and I'll always support their right to develop an education program that best meets the needs of their children and matches their values. We value the many sacrifices that homeschool parents make for their children, as many parents across the world are now learning for the first time. This is no easy task and it requires unyielding commitment, steadfast support, boundless patience, and perhaps a good sense of humor. So I thank all of you for doing what's right for your students during this national emergency. Yes, these are tough times, but we the people are tougher. Keep up the good work. And I wanna welcome uh, the Honorable Kelvin Gertsen, uh, the Minister of Education for the province of Manitoba in Canada. Uh, Minister Gertsen has served as an elected official, as an official in the province of Manitoba in the legislature for the last 17 years and uh, serves now uh, as the Minister of Education, previously served as the, um, as the Minister of Health, uh, so has considerable experience uh, 
uh, Minister Gertsen uh, has experience uh, at both the federal and the provincial level uh, in political uh, political roles. And uh, uh, Minister Gertsen is married uh, to his wife Kim. Uh, they have a son, but named Malachi. And uh, I consider uh, Minister Gertsen certainly to be one of the uh, one of the warriors uh, for freedom uh, in uh, in Canada and uh, consider him to be a great friend. And, uh, and I want to welcome Minister Gertsen to, uh, to our panel here today uh, and uh, would uh, love to hear uh, from you, Minister Gertsen, from you, Kelvin, the, your views on what can home educators do, what can home education leaders do uh, to help parents, uh, certainly around Manitoba, Canada, around the world uh, in dealing with what we have in front of us, this unprecedented pandemic. Welcome, Minister Gertsen. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Gerald, and thank you for the invitation to be here from Global Homeschooling uh, Education Exchange and for organizing uh, what you have organized uh, this morning. I appreciate it. So I'm here in Manitoba in the middle of Canada, for those of you who uh, need to visualize that in terms of where we are. Everybody has interesting uh, backgrounds. Mine um, is a jersey that hangs in my office here at the in Parliament in uh, in Manitoba. It's the Winnipeg Jets jersey. It was six weeks ago today that they played their last game, and so uh, everybody's going through challenges and missing things. And certainly in Canada, we're missing hockey. Uh, what I can't miss is uh, cabinet, which begins in uh, about uh, 50 minutes, and so I, I won't be able to be with you for the whole morning and the whole presentation. But I uh, look forward to hearing what I can and maybe catching up later on in the things that I, I miss. So this is uh, you know, a unique opportunity, um, even though it is a difficult time for many, many people uh, in the world and in Canada where I live. As the Minister of Education, I've certainly heard from uh, parents who are now all collectively homeschooling in some fashion, um, how it's going. And there is you know, a spectrum like there is in anything about how it's going, hearing a lot of good things uh, and a lot of unique experiences, but also hearing a lot of stress from uh, individuals who didn't plan to be homeschooling, to have their children uh, at home. Uh, added to that fact is that they're dealing with their own sort of personal challenges, whether that's a financial challenge, loss of a job, health stress, isolation, uh, and now, of course, their children are at home. And so a lot of them, and I'm hearing it in my office and in different places as education minister, are feeling the pressure to teach their, their kids. And social media, while it can be a great help in many things, uh, often what shows up on social media can be the best of things that are happening in people's lives. And so I'm hearing from parents who are saying, well, we're seeing all these great experiences that other parents are having with having their kids at home and trying to do some schooling at home. And we're not having that experience. And so they're feeling guilt, uh, a lot of them, and are expressing that sort of guilt that they're feeling because they're not able to do what others are. And so for you who've had a lot more experience and are leaders, of course, in the homeschooling movement, I think that there's an opportunity uh, to, to reach out and to remind them that it's not all on them, uh, that it's not, uh, not all up to those parents now uh, to become the, uh, the teachers or the educators in one fell swoop and maybe to relieve some of that pressure that they are suddenly feeling. Um, but also then to remind them that, that while they shouldn't feel the overwhelming burden of this pressure, because of course, uh, this isn't something that they've been planning for for weeks or months, uh, this is something that was sort of sprung upon them, that they may never go through this again, uh, which is because what society overall is hoping for, that we don't go through a pandemic like this again. But within every difficult situation, whether it's a pandemic or something that happens within our personal lives, there are also great opportunities. And so I'm also hearing that from those who never expected to sort of be homeschooling, even in a crisis situation, who are saying, and I had a conversation yesterday with a parent on the way home, I was driving and um, we, were, we were talking and, and he was saying, you know, Kelvin, the, the opportunities that are happening now for me and for our children, and we're talking about things and interacting in certain ways, uh, is really, really unique and very, very special. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to remind uh, those who are going through this to remember that and to look for those opportunities wherever they can look for those opportunities. Because some very, very positive things 
can come from this experience as well. And then when it comes to interacting with, with government, so the criticism that I most often hear about government generally, not in times of a pandemic, but almost at every other time uh, in the 17 years that I've been elected is that government acts very, very slowly and that government is very, very resistant to change. The institution of government is essentially structured that way. Uh, but now we're in a time where uh, everything is operating almost exactly opposite. Everything is happening very, very fastly, very, very quickly. And government is doing things that are completely foreign and different to what government normally does. And I've certainly experienced that in my role in education and watching what's happening in other departments. So suddenly there's a willingness, and not only a willingness, but a desire to look outside the box and say, how can we now deliver programs that we might not have imagined three weeks ago to deliver them quickly and deliver them in a different way. And I think that for leaders in the homeschooling uh, movement, that opens up an opportunity because now leaders in government are really looking for ideas and willing to implement ideas pretty quickly, uh, far more quickly than they'd ever had before. We're also seeing that technology, and this is a demonstration of it, can bring new educational opportunities that, that didn't, uh, well, maybe have existed for a little while, but maybe haven't been on the radar of government or government uh, officials. And so that's important to remember that we have these sort of unique opportunities. I would say to you as those who are in the, in the homeschooling movement, that as you take these opportunities now, if you, if you have the opportunity to interact with government officials, recognizing now the door is sort of open to ideas and a willingness to move on certain things, that to, to, to speak not just about the right of homeschooling. And, and I'm a big, a strong advocate, our government's a strong advocate for the right of homeschoolers, of independent schools, uh, really just of the right to have parental involvement and control over education of young people in our province and in Canada. Um, and so we speak about the right, but that's not really what education ministers spend their time talking about. We, t we almost never talk about rights in education as education ministers when we meet together. We talk about results. Our language is about results. What are the results that we're getting in our K-12 education system? And, and I would encourage the, uh, those who are leaders and homeschoolers to remember that and, and, and not just simply you know, advocate for the right to homeschooling, but talk about the great results that you're getting. How are your young people doing? And we know that they can do exceptionally well, and they are doing exceptionally well. And that it, 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 uh, it's a demonstration of, of how well it's doing. And some of the, uh, many of the young people who come out of homeschooling can take that, that results-oriented focus into the discussion when you're talking about the rights of education. Because ultimately, as education ministers, that's what our focus is, and the rights will often follow the results uh, in many different things. So, so don't lose sight of that that homeschooling isn't just a right, it's a good education. It's a wonderful opportunity. And you're gonna see that opportunity now being able to demonstrate it in this time. Uh, I know I was given seven minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap up shortly. I, I wanted to, to also say that at this time, you also have a very unique opportunity to knock down misconceptions. And those who have homeschooled over the years, years you will know what those misconceptions are. You don't need me to remind you of those misconceptions, but you know, you'll have heard about, you know, well, the students are socially isolated when they're, when they're homeschooled. They don't, they don't have the opportunity to be with others. Well, we're learning a lot about social, social isolation now, aren't we? And that while we are physically distanced from each other, we're not really socially distanced. And we are changing the terminology. We're not supposed to say now that we're social distancing, we're physically distancing, because we don't want to be socially distanced. And in fact, I think there are some social connections that are happening more, maybe more strongly than they've ever happened before, even in a time of isolation. And so I think some of that misconception can be torn down to say there are so many ways that homeschoolers and their students can be connected and are connected uh, at this time, but then at, at every time, every normal time when we come back to uh, a normal way of, uh, of living. Uh, and then to remind leaders that that is happening all the time within homeschooling there are broad-based networks and that there are resources that have been built up and that exist uh, uh, already within that network. And that can be strengthened, that can be improved. So there's this really great opportunity, I think, as well, to bring down some of those misconceptions. So sort of to summarize, I would look towards the parental part of it and, and to help those who are 
uh, struggling, but also feeling guilt that they're not able to, to do this as well as, as they uh, see others doing it. Remind them that they were kind of thrown into this. This isn't a planned homeschooling uh, environment and that there are others out there to support them and to help them. But within that, to look for those unique opportunities. What are the things that your, your kids are gonna be able to remember from this? Can you build those stronger connections that you might not have been able to do at a time when your, your kids weren't at home and you were too busy with, within your job? Because a lot of that is happening, but I think you sometimes have to actively look for it. And then in speaking to government leaders, we're in a unique time. Things are moving quickly. Government's willing to think outside the box, which is a criticism we get. We often, we don't do that. So consider that, bring those solutions uh, to government. Um, do so in a way that focuses as much about results as, as it is about rights uh, because government wants to hear about results and not just uh, individual uh, perceptions on rights and then break down those misconceptions because that, that, that opportunity exists now I think more than ever for homeschoolers to understand that hey this is not only is, is, a, is, a, is a right that has results but can actually be done in a way uh, that we never maybe had realized before or never really put our, our minds around. So thank you again for, for letting me join you. Happy to take any questions or just hear some, uh, some comments. Uh, and, and thank you for the work that you're doing all the time, right? I mean, we, uh, we, we know that homeschooling is a valuable part of our education system, but it's sometimes it's a little off the radar. But now uh, it's been thrown right on the radar because uh, everybody's become a homeschooler in some form, uh, fashion, former fashion. In, uh, in many of our countries. And so thank you again, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, any comments you have. Well, thank, thank you very much, Minister Gertsen. Uh, certainly appreciate your perspective and know that you know homeschooling well. I know that in your constituency, uh, you have many, many homeschoolers, and it's unfortunate that uh, you were not able to participate in our uh, Manitoba homeschool conference that uh, was canceled several weeks ago and uh, um, we we hope that we'll be able to get back to that but uh, just a, a point of, uh, of announcement for everyone uh, the Facebook connection is is a bit spotty so we are going to be recording uh, the whole uh, uh, whole event and it will be available for download at a later time should people uh, not be able to participate fully that way but we'll be uh, recording it. Uh, Mike uh, Donnelly uh, you've got a question. Uh, for and just real Gerson. quick we're I know we're running low on time here Minister thank you for being with us. Um, as a senior education official a government official um, you know there may be some policymakers from other countries and other provinces and states listening. There are some places where there's a lot of misconceptions about homeschooling and government officials don't want to allow homeschooling freely. What would you tell those um, officials? So thanks very much, uh, Mike, for the, for the question. So I approach it from a, a number of different angles. So purely from the, from the rights perspective, um, I think we have to look historically at and many of those who are in the different jurisdictions that we represent. And I'll speak about the area that I represent, but I know this would be replicated in, in other provinces and other states. Uh, so there are many people within the province of Manitoba who have left other countries, uh, and my, uh, my ancestors would have been some of them, uh, who came to Manitoba because they wanted uh, freedom of religion and closely connected to freedom of religion was the freedom to, to have education uh, and to have input in terms of how that education was delivered. And so it is, it's, it's strongly connected to the history of our province and it'll be strongly connected to the history, uh, I believe of every state within the United States and certainly uh, across Canada. And so to remember that it exists uh, not as, uh, as, as a right that is simply sort of entrenched in different legal documents, but uh, as a result of the history of how our provinces and how our states have developed. Uh, then I would look beyond that. And we often as educators, and this goes to the issue of results, we talk about how different students learn differently and how they thrive in different environments uh, and that it isn't a one size fits all environment. So within our public school system, some school students do well and don't do well and there are reasons for that. And we try to sort of wrap around and figure out how we can help those students who aren't doing well. Uh, and, but part of that isn't just about then looking at that as the only solution. We then say independent schools have an opportunity 
to be involved as part of that. Of course, some of those are faith-based schools, and that goes back to that opportunity to have independence within um, the education system. But then for, for many, homeschooling uh, will be the way in which their families and their students do the best and they get the best results. And ultimately that is what it is about, is how do you get those best results and to uh, choice and freedoms are, are certainly a, a huge part of that equation. But I always wanna go back to, we have so many homeschoolers who are doing so well that let's not forget that the results, which we all talk about as education ministers, is critical as well. Minister, thank you, and uh, we uh, we appreciate your ongoing support and uh, ongoing part of uh, of the global dialogue. So thank you for that. Um, we'll keep moving along, and I'm going to ask my uh, good friend uh, Mike Donnelly uh, from uh, Washington D.C. area, actually from West Virginia, uh, to uh, to speak. Uh, Mike is the uh, uh, the secretary of the Global Home Education Exchange Council and serves as the Global Outreach Director with the Homeschool Legal Defense Association of America, and uh, is one of the tireless um, champions uh, around the world and, uh, and a good friend. So, so Mike, welcome, and we look forward to, uh, to your sharing. Uh, first things first, how can we help? That's a good question. Well, Gerald, thank you. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm a tireless warrior. I'm getting old and the miles are starting to wear on me a little bit, but uh, I certainly am tireless in my spirit and commitment to uh, home education as a homeschool dad. I have seven children. My wife, Patty, and I have homeschooled our seven children for going on 20 years now, and we still have four to graduate, three in college or graduated from college. Uh, it's a real privilege to serve the homeschool community. I'm so excited by the, the group of leaders we've been able to gather here today. And you know, our goal here is to equip uh, leaders in the homeschool community, and really every homeschooling family can exercise leadership at this time uh, during this coronavirus pandemic and, and support and reach out to those many millions of people who uh, have never experienced this before. I'd like to share my screen here, and I'll run through a few uh, slides with you. Um, you know, what we're talking about here is helping struggling families and searching policymakers. And, uh, you know, when you talk about the impact of this coronavirus pandemic, uh, the UNESCO organization estimates that 90% of all enrolled learners around the world have been affected with school closings. That's 1.5 billion, with a B, 1.5 billion children have been affected, 191 countrywide school closures. What does that mean? Does that mean that everyone is homeschooling now? Uh, I know some of my fellow panelists are going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to just make a few points. Suddenly, schooling at home, which is what the 1.5 billion people are now doing, is very different from what most people would think of as traditional homeschooling. Um, and, and what is happening now is crisis management. Uh, you can call it coronavirus schooling, crisis schooling, uh, but certainly it's not something that was done intentionally by most people. Most people are reacting to the fact that the schools are now closed. What people really need now is encouragement, not confusion. Uh, for homeschoolers around the world, well, I wanna encourage you leaders, now's not the time necessarily to draw super hard lines in the sand about, oh, this is homeschooling, that's homeschooling. Um, this is a time for us to reach out and help our neighbors, friends, uh, fellow travelers on the planet Earth, how we can do this thing together. And we've just got, got a lot of experience because we've been doing it for a long time in the homeschooling community. They need, they need support, not judgment. Um, now's not the time to say, you're not really homeschooling. Uh, you're suddenly schooling at home. The time for helping people make the transition from suddenly schooling at home or crisis schooling to real homeschooling is coming, though. But well, we gotta support these folks who are struggling now with their children at home, balancing so many things. Um, and what we need is a short-term and a long-term plan. People are in crisis mode right now, but many of them are tasting the joy of what homeschooling is and they're going to want more. Uh, we're seeing that on social media, we're seeing that in many, many places. What's the impact? We have an immediate and long-term impact that we're dealing with. If schools are shifting to distance learning, but over 50%, according to UNESCO, do not have access to technology or computers. And so distance learning is really not working for them. In Africa alone, 83% of all learners and people don't have access to distance learning. So that's not really a long-term solution. And, and even the UNESCO people say that it's not a long-term solution because face-to-face -face interaction is very important for the learning to happen. Some countries, uh, about 191, have suspended all instruction. And parents, as I said, are struggling to balance work, survival, and education. 
Um, longer term, you're going to see some private schools as a result of the loss in revenue from tuition are going to fail. And public schools may remain closed depending on the, uh, the curve of the coronavirus as it makes its way across the world and there may be flare ups. Um, there's, going, there's a significant economic impact that is coming and it's going to have a, an impact on public school resources as well. Uh, and parents are gonna face a decision point in the fall or spring, depending on which part of the globe you're on, north or south, when schools reopen. They're gonna have a decision to make, which is whether they're gonna send their child back to the public school or keep them at home, and there may not be a private school for them. So what do we need for education? For families, we need to help families. This is for leaders. What do we need to help families? We need to help families with a vision, with a mindset that learning isn't a place, that it can happen anywhere. We need to encourage the families. We need to help them understand that schooling at home can work. We've been doing this for decades, 60, 70 years of the modern homeschooling movement. The research shows that it works. And here's an opportunity to make the most of it. And Knut from Africa is going to talk about that later. MomPossible.org is a website that um, we set up at HSLDA. I'm going to talk with you about that a little bit later. I'm having a little trouble with my, my um, keyboard here, sorry. Uh, learning resources. You know, there's lots of resources out there, even in places that aren't resource constrained. And there's no need to replicate school at home. I think we need to tell people that homeschooling or even crisis schooling doesn't have to be an exact copy of the schedule of school at home. Um, Learn Everywhere is a great resource online available to anybody with a Facebook account to get some support. And technology still allows for that support, as the minister said. We may be physically distanced, but there are still ways for us to make that connection. For policymakers, what leaders need to do is support, is encourage policymakers to support innovation with less control. The more government gets out of the way, the more people can experiment with new things and try new things. Decentralized learning works. And when you decentralize the family with parents who love their kids or doing the best they can to guide them and find resources for them, that's gonna produce really good things. We, policymakers can support parents with resources and regulatory f- reform and trust fa- parents. Parents can be trusted. Uh, you're seeing some uh, bit of a, of a flare up in the United States with a Harvard University article that basically said that you can't trust parents, that the government has to control all education and no children, virtually no children should be homeschooled. And if you wanna learn about that, just you can just uh, Google um, Harvard University Alumni Association and Elizabeth Barthelet. Um, we, we need to seize the opportunity to see education in a new way and encourage policymakers to do that. Things cannot stay the same following this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And this is an opportunity where we as, an, as, a, as a people all over the world have an opportunity to look at education differently. And freedom is a viable policy. We need to encourage those policymakers to, to embrace freedom for families to try this. Parents want to do what's best for their kids. That's what common sense and nature shows. And government should respect and protect this. HSLDA has produced uh, a new website called mompossible.org with videos, downloads, and and a mentoring um, application. And I'd just like to share that with you for just a minute. Uh, Take a quick tour of it. And um, if I can get that on here just very, very quickly. Uh, Sorry, I had it up here and I must have closed it. I know we've gone through this quickly, but uh, this is gonna be recorded, so you'll be able to uh, watch this if you want. Okay, so we're going to turn on, share, Mom Possible, there it is. Okay, so mompossible.org is the website, and this is what it looks like very, very briefly. Uh, Just scroll down, there's a quiz. Uh, You know, the messaging is, Really, it's mom oriented, although we know that it's not just moms who are doing the homeschooling and dads are very important for homeschooling, but there's only so much you could do in a short period of time. Um, We want people to be confident. We want to help them be confident in this crisis. We've got some videos for them, for working parents, helping people create stability, uh, getting through June. Um, We've got downloads for people to use, a working mom schedule, family table topics. Uh, We've got FAQs. And you can check out the Facebook group. There's a mentoring group. If you click on that, it'll take you to a Facebook mentoring group where experienced homeschool moms and others can connect with people who are trying to figure out what to do during this coronavirus crisis. So Gerald, thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, Thank you again to the panelists and I'll turn it back over to you. 
And Mike, thank you. Uh, you that uh, mompossible.org is fantastic and a great resource. Thank you to HSLD US for producing that for certainly the US, but for, for around the world. Uh, your leadership is, uh, is so valuable. Thank you for that. Um, We'll keep moving with our uh, with our agenda, and uh, Minister Gertsen, I know that at some point you need to step off, and if I don't have an opportunity to thank you before you do that, just feel free to uh, to step off when you need to, and uh, uh, we appreciate it. Um, but we'll uh, we'll keep moving along here on the uh, on the agenda. Next uh, next on our speakers is uh, uh, Erica De Martino uh, from Italy. Uh, Erica is uh, is first of all a homeschool mom. Uh, of five homeschool children uh, aged between four and 15. And she's been involved in education in Europe for, uh, for over 10 years. And she's the founder of the uh, Italian Home Education Network uh, with, a, with a website uh, that I'm sure she'll tell you about. Uh, she's a writer uh, and, uh, and I think she brings to us the experience both as a leader and as a homeschool mom. Erica, welcome to our panel here today. And we're looking forward to your sharing about homeschooling in hard times. And I know that there has been certainly hard times in Italy uh, and uh, look forward to your sharing uh, the experience that you've had as, as a homeschool leader and mom uh, homeschooling through that and what you can share with others from around the world. Thank you so much, Gerald, for the invitation. Yes, I am here. I'm tuning in from Milan in the north of Italy. And first, I would like to share a little bit of history just to help you understand what we have been going through uh, with an insider point of view. Uh, the first lockdowns in Italy happened around February the 21st, 2020, and it covered, first of all, 11 municipalities. And on March 9th, the prime minister imposed a national quarantine and the one that you are familiar with, with, where all commercial and retail businesses are closed except those providing essential services. At the moment, as I am speaking, the Italian army is patrolling our streets and the use of drones has been approved for surveillance purposes. And this quarantine, this situation will continue uh, until May 3rd and then we will see. The idea of um, reopening the schools, uh, first of all, the schools have been closed, yes, since late February, and they will not reopen until the end of the school year. The idea of reopening schools is seen at the moment as too risky due to the fact that it would mean some 12 million people, students, teachers, school staff, caterers, and others um, moving around. So um, from September, actually, the ministers are considering for the beginning of the new school year, a staggering or partial reopening of schools, or perhaps still having all classes taught remotely. So this is a possibility for the coming school year here in Italy. So teaching is moving online on a, a untested and unprecedented scale for this country. Student assessments are also moving online with a lot of trial and error and uncertainty for everyone. And this decision is also impacting the homeschooling community, the Italian homeschooling community, as yearly testing has been mandatory for us since 2018, after a highly debated uh, school reform was approved. And this reform is known as La Buona Scuola, which means the good school. And it's uh, the first uh, uh, reform that actually considered homeschooling. It was the first time simply to restrict the freedom of those who choose it by enforcing a mandatory yearly examination on the children. While not specifying any guidelines on how the testing would take place, thus leading to bias and confusion for both the schools and the families, I must admit. Um, as we speak right now, the homeschooling parents of Italy haven't been informed on how the annual exams will take place this year. And we are about a month from the testing. So we're really close. And we're still waiting to know if there are any guidelines whatsoever. Um, this is part of numerous uncertainties regarding all forms of education, not only in homeschooling, that the Italian minister will hopefully resolve in this coming week. And despite the difficult situation, which leads me to have you know, a more understanding and compassionate point of view regarding the tasks of the minister, I am struggling with the feeling that home education in Italy at the moment is seen by uh, the government as the last man on the totem pole, despite being a constitutional right here in Italy and the academic path chosen every year by more and more Italian families. 
we do see an increase every year statistically we see an increase in homeschooling families uh, in our country and especially now we are a huge resource for all those parents who are struggling with being isolated with their children and not knowing how to deal with the situation what we are observing here in italy is that the parents role at the moment is seen as a complement to the input from school but being the primer the prime drive driver of learning in conjunction with school orchestrated online materials which is what happening for, is happening for most families is a different question far from the reality of homeschooling um, the media is calling it homeschooling when it should be uh, probably defined a school-centered distance learning or even better isolation schooling as the children haven't been allowed out of their homes not even for a 10-minute walk around the block for nearly seven weeks now um, while many parents around the world do successfully school their children at home this seems unlikely to generalize over the whole population at the moment especially now in this moment of crisis and uncertainty if there is no given instruction so we are here actually to give and help and support the families quarantine schooling is not only a massive shock to the parents productivity but it's also affecting the children's social life and learning um, all children here homeschoolers included are suffering greatly at the present moment my main concern is for the children's well-being rather than their education children have boundless energy that needs to be that needs to be expressed that needs space to flow and they're all cooped in the, indoors all day with no possibility to take a breath of fresh air and i can't imagine those families in small apartments of course there are positive aspects of hitting the pause button as we are especially for those overworked overscheduled children who are finally finding the time to dedicate to their interests and passions or many others who are discovering the benefits of a regular sleeping pattern and the advantage of leading a less stressful and hectic lifestyle but let's take a look right now and see what we can do as homeschoolers to serve our community given these grave circumstances in most cases both academics and students in traditional school systems right now are lacking the training needed for quality online learning it just happened all of a sudden nobody was formally prepared for students who are not adequately equipped with basic technological tools and skills as mike you know showed us in his in his statistics and that is a lot of italy as well a lot of pupils in italy uh, do not have the technological tools and skills um, watching poor quality pre-recorded or live online lecture videos can be frustrating on the contrary many italian homeschoolers have already been engaged with online learning and have homes equipped uh, to cater to this need i lead the italian home education network and i have been doing so for nearly 10 years now and we have been educating and supporting families in developing plans for online learning and demonstrating with our own experience the importance of having a reliable access to the internet at home while keeping kids and the communities connected um, and this has happened for 10 years nearly since we founded the network in 2012. i believe our role as homeschoolers is now to help people to respond to this national and global crisis unexpectedly in the last month the media has turned to us and this is incredible they have turned to us asking for advice on how to cope with the difficulties earlier described i have been busy counseling releasing interviews uh, for radios and newspapers and producing short videos filled with useful practical content uh, addressed to the parents of school children mainly who are exasperated and demotivated since they have never had to deal with their children in this way and we are receiving many emails and comments on social media of parents interested in starting homeschooling in September. And they need to know the basics. They need to know the basics of choosing this path. And for this purpose, actually, we, I felt very much connected with the project uh, for the moms and the mentoring because we have just released uh, this week a free mentoring program for Italian homeschoolers, wannabes, who will be in close contact with senior homeschoolers for the next four weeks many homeschoolers many homeschooling mothers are now reaching out to their circles and they're giving hands-on examples on how to manage house chores the job their job and the children's education with the collaboration of other family members and they are 
incredibly preventing family crises and burnouts and it's amazing to watch them work together. I truly believe that um, the home education community is now spiritually, physically, mental, and mentally equipped in a way that can benefit the global community. And regarding the Italian situation, there have been tangible examples of this. And I am personally using all the technologies at my disposal to assist, encourage, and inspire others. And my husband and my five children are doing the same. Before the COVID-19 emergency in this, in, the, in this country, you know, we were often regarded as eccentric, as non-conformist, as individualists. And yet now we are seen as a, a resource, as a positive outcome, and we're seen as a solution. People will not forget who was close to them in this moment of need. And I really think that we have to seize the opportunity to see education under a new point of view. Thank you so much. I will be happy if there are any questions. Thank you so much for, for listening and you know, organizing this. If there are any questions and comments regarding the situation of homeschoolers in Italy, I will be happy to assist them. Erica, thank you. Uh, really appreciate your, uh, uh, your remarks and uh, we will hold questions uh, to the end and uh, appreciate your willingness to participate in that. Uh, moving along in our agenda, we'd like to move to the United States and welcome Carrie McDonald. Uh, Carrie is a senior research fellow with the Foundation for Education or Economic Education. Uh, she's an author and uh, mother of uh, four children, uh, certainly has done a lot of writing and speaking uh, uh, on the topic of home education. And uh, Carrie, we've, uh, we've asked you to, to talk to us about the message, the communication. How do we unpack the message of homeschooling in this, uh, in this world where there's so many messages flying around? So uh, over to you. Thanks for being with us, Carrie. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you all and to be talking about what really is a global homeschooling moment. I think Erica made the point quite clearly that although this is a crisis moment for so many of us and so stressful and anxiety inducing around the world, it also is an incredible moment for homeschooling parents and leaders are being smarter to try to help parents. And so I know that, you know, one of the things I've been focused on is um, really presenting the message that what we're experiencing now is nothing like authentic homeschooling. I uh, am a homeschooling mother of four children uh, here in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. And, you know, what we're experiencing now is very much what everyone is experiencing in terms of being cut off from our community and distanced from the people, places, and things uh, of our broader neighborhoods. And so this is nothing like authentic homeschoolers. Homeschoolers, as we all know, of course, are far from isolated and are, you know, immersed authentically again in um, real socialization in our communities. So this is difficult for everybody. But you know, one of the points that I've been trying to make is that even though this is nothing like authentic homeschooling, I do think families can get a glimpse, albeit very stressful and under difficult circumstances, of what learning alongside children can be like and what learning without schooling can look like. Uh, and this is where, you know, as, as I think Michael mentioned and Erica mentioned, you know, families are starting to question uh, schooling. You know, there's my social media feeds I know are filling with uh, parents who are saying, wow, you know, this isn't as bad as I thought, or I've always wanted to try homeschooling, but I lacked that catalyst, that inertia to make it happen. And now I have this opportunity and it's going really well. And I can't imagine sending my child back to school. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, as difficult a time as this is, one of the things that's really special is seeing the uh, tremendous online learning resources that are sprouting daily, many of which, most of which really are free. And so I think it's giving families an opportunity to see the way in which you can facilitate a child's learning uh, without feeling like you have to be the primary instructor all the time. I mean, you know, one of the things that's really um, been inspiring for me is to see these, you know, world famous authors and illustrators offering daily uh, workshops, reading their stories to children or 
providing illustration workshops for, uh, for families. You're seeing daily concerts being issued, offered around the world, live streamed. Uh, 2,500 museums around the world have free virtual tours. So I think it's, it's a way of um, pre presenting this message to families that there's so much learning to be had now, so many ideas to explore that we may not have had a chance to do under other circumstances. I think that's a key piece of our role as homeschool leaders is to um, really push back, I think, on, on sort of the dominant narrative that we're seeing around um, learning loss that's occurring during coronavirus or the idea that this is an educational calamity because young people are not in school. And instead, turn that around to say, look at how much learning can be gained, not only using the vast resources of these online learning uh, materials, but also just being together with family and reconnecting with children and encouraging children to pursue their interests and their passions outside of schooling. You know, I have a neighbor who, um, whose child goes to public elementary school and she has been just astounded at how her child has been rekindling a lot of that curiosity uh, that she has sort of lost over the time in school, reading, now reading books that she's really passionate about and writing short stories that are meaningful to her. And I think parents are getting glimpses of this. So the message for us as homeschool leaders to other parents who are dealing with this crisis is obviously not to under, uh, to minimize the, the difficult experiencing. This is a challenging time for all of us, but also to encourage them to not worry so much about what their children are losing and instead encourage them to see what their children can gain and what they can gain as a family. Um, and one of the, the great stories that I've been trying to spotlight that I think illustrates this uh, is the story of Isaac Newton, who back in the 17th century was a college student uh, in during the bubonic plague that hit London, actually um, killed a quarter of the London population in only 18 months. Uh, and during that epidemic, Isaac Newton, like other college students, fled to his childhood home. And he would call, it would be called his year of wonders because when he was home, away from college, away from uh, professors and assignments, he was able to do his most creative work. He would say it would be the peak of his intellectual uh, discovery and it would be the foundation for his science discoveries over the coming years, including his theory of gravity, his theory of optics, uh, discovering integral and differential mathematics calculus. So, you know, I think that's a, a great story for us to also take away and to spread for other homeschoolers and parents curious about homeschooling is instead of this being a time of of decay or a time of learning loss, this could be a time of maximum productivity and creativity, not only for children, but for parents as well. Uh, and that really, I think, is an inspirational message. So we don't want to minimize, again, the difficulties that parents are encountering. This is very difficult for all of us. But if we can try to be inspirational and say that there, there can be so much to learn and so much more that we can, uh, we can be, be exploring during this time, I think that, that that can really be a full message. Because I do think that after this uh, pandemic ends, there will be more parents who are curious about alternatives to school, whether that's homeschooling or virtual schooling. Um, or other types of uh, innovative models around schooling, um, there will be more parental demand, I think, for educational freedom. And we can help to support those parents uh, and that, those policies. And for policymakers, I think along those lines, it would be things like, again, encouraging uh, education choice mechanisms for families to put families back in charge of their child's education. And also, you know, we're seeing uh, in, in all kinds of industries, healthcare most specifically around uh, loosening many of these regulations and that allowing for uh, experimentation, innovation, and invention. I think we should encourage the same thing from a policy level uh, with education. And we've seen compulsory attendance laws, for example, being loosened during this pandemic. And that would be something, again, that we could encourage um, to have continued post-pandemic 
to allow for a lot of this educational innovation and experimentation that would sprout when individuals, families, and organizations are given that free. So, um, you know, a difficult time for everybody, but I do think we can uh, present an inspiring message and really look at this as a moment to empower families. Well, Carrie, thank you for for that message, uh, for that inspiration, for that uh, that encouragement to us uh, to uh, to go and uh, tell others and uh, and to tell our story. And I, I thank you for that. Um, we appreciate it greatly, and we'll have uh, have opportunity for more discussion. But I'd like to go now to Africa. I'd like to welcome Knut Wazwa. Knut uh, is a father, a homeschooling father of three from Kenya. Uh, Knut is very involved with the East Africa Homeschool um, uh, community of, and, uh, and is also part of the, uh, the African subcommittee of the Global Home Education Exchange Council, uh, who actually had a conference in South Africa uh, not that long ago. So um, it's uh, great to have you here with us, Knut. I know that, that you're very involved in things outdoor. Uh, outward bound and uh, education and hiking and those things and and i suspect some of that is a little bit more restricted these days i'm not sure it certainly <laughs> is in, in some parts of the world but uh, we welcome welcome you here and uh, look forward to your your uh, uh, your presentation and your thoughts yes thank you thank you very much um i'm a homeschooling father of three i have two girls and one boy the girls are 14 and 10 and the boy is 12. My wife and I have homeschooled our children from birth, and we have been advising homeschooling families around Kenya and within the East African and African region for the last 10 years. So first to give you context, because Africa is very different. I am the second in my generation to have formal education. My father was the first one in our lineage to get formal education. And my wife and I, were the first ones in our lineage to go to university. And the reason for that is because Kenya was a British colony. I became a British colony in 1920, and it's only just about 10 years later that we started getting formal education as a country. And that happened a lot. It happened a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but my question is, was learning happening before that? And I would say yes, and emphatically so. But the difference is learning was integrated with life and a lot of coaching and mentoring. It was very, very organic. So in a sense, what the corona pandemic has done for the world is what colonialism did for us uh, in 1920, because it just came and disrupted our style of learning and, and we got ourselves into this. Now, uh, for, for those who are in, for the audience who are in Africa, you can really relate to my story because growing up, there was something called a report card and it, it showed what you scored in math and science and English and everything. And at the end of every term, you'd bring it home and your dad would sit down and ask for your report card. And by watching your dad's facial expressions and body language, you'd be able to tell whether you performed well, thumbs up, or if it was a thumbs down. Uh, now, the interesting thing is my dad always told me that he was number one. But the problem is, I knew many of his friends, and all his friends are also number one. So I kept wondering, how many number ones are there in that class? But looking back, I realized that just like my dad, every parent wanted an answer to what it means to raise solid, successful children. And that's informed by many things. It's informed by, by socialization, history, the kind of schooling and education we had, friends, influence. And, and now that I'm homeschooling three of my own, I also ask myself, what do I want out of at the end of my children's education? And I guess this is what everyone in the world wants. You want happy children. You want them to be safe. You want them to be comfortable. You want them, once they go out of the nest, to be able to hold a job and take care of themselves. Now, here in Africa, the, the answer to that question is you must give your children a good, solid educational foundation. Now, when you ask around, what does that educational foundation mean? Uh, as 
as a result of this pandemic, we've been asked a lot uh, by, by friends, by families, we've been called to radio stations and television stations to just talk about matters education. And I have always talked about five things that at the end of your children's education, they must have a healthy sense of self, that they can believe in their principles, even in the face of opposition, they can trust their own judgment, they can trust in their capacity to solve problems. At the end of their education, they must have a sense of personal competence, you know, knowing that there is something they are good at, a skill, a knowledge, an expertise, where they can go and have sustenance and take care of themselves. They must have what you'd call relational skills or soft skills or emotional intelligence, being able to read body language and facial expressions so that wherever they go, they can be able to fit into that culture and even blossom in that context. They must have a sense of integrity, you know, that my word is my bond that when we agree on something, you can consider it done. What you see is what you get. And finally, unapologetically, part of what I call proper education is the fear of the Lord. You know, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So looking at all that and getting back to the question, how can we take advantage of COVID-19 to be able to infuse this. I mean, first you can see it's very clear when you look at schooling in its form and shape, you will struggle to get these deliverables because I'm not talking about, you know, A material and geniuses in chemistry and physics. But how can we take advantage of this situation? The first one is interestingly, as, as Mike Donnelly was saying, in Africa, uh, we 83% will not have access to resources like uh, like IT resources and laptops for distance learning. But for you to get a healthy sense of self, what do you need to do? You need to affirm your children with your words, verbatim. I mean, there's something psychologists call Pygmalion effect, the self-fulfilling prophecy, that if you tell your children, you can do it, you have what it takes. It works for children, it works for employees in companies, it works for sports people. During Corona, it works. After all, you are in your house, there's nowhere else to go, just give them the affirming words. And the other interesting thing is the best way to communicate security to your children as a man is to love your wife. Why? Because even research has shown that next to divorce, the most emotionally destabilizing occurrence that can ever happen in anyone's life is just death. And so this is a perfect opportunity to affirm your children by strengthening your relationships with your spouses. After all, we are in each other's faces. There's nowhere to go. We had better make the best of it. When we talk about personal competence, personal competence, everyone and every parent has things that you can naturally teach your children. As you have said, I'm an outdoors guy. Uh, hiking and camping is part of our staple and DNA. But during this Corona season, when we are on lockdown, we can go to the balcony at night and do stellar navigation, which for me is, I'm a subject matter expert. Look at the constellations that are familiar with us in the tropics, look at Orion, look at the Big Dipper, uh, figure out where is True North, where is Magnetic North, and in a very organic way, just teach my children what they know. Now, they have no idea this is supposed to be an MBA lesson. But guess what? It can be dressmaking, it can be crocheting, it can be baking, but every parent has something that you are good at that you can teach your children. That is how you give them competence. Secondly, this is a perfect opportunity to try out new things. You have never baked, try baking. If the bread is bad, it's okay. Tomorrow we are still here anyway. We'll bake another loaf of bread. And with time you'll get to discover, even in life, 80% of businesses fail in the first five years. But guess what? Data has shown 94% of homeschoolers succeed in the first year. So if you can bake bread together, believe you me, you can do fractions together. And then thirdly, you can build competence by just reading wonderful books with the children. It's only two days ago that I got to realize that um, uh, the book by C.S. Lewis, uh, Mere Christianity, 
actually started as a radio series by the BBC during the Second World War. People were in their homes, there were, there were bombs all over, and C.S. Lewis would go and, and read the series. And now, this is a perfect opportunity for you to read wonderful books with your children. I mean, right now, as a family, we are reading Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda Adichie, which talks about the civil war in Nigeria. And we are learning African history, post-colonial history. We are learning social anthropology. All these lessons are coming in a very organic way. And guess what? The children are loving it. And then on relational skills during this COVID pandemic, this is when to practice hospitality with your children. How do you set a table? How do you receive visitors? How do you have small talks with guests in your house? You know, this is everybody's chance to actually become an expert in developmental psychology. Forget Eric Erickson. This is practical psychology. It is here with us. Nature has put us in this context. And guess what? You can thrive as you do it. And then we talk about personal integrity. Now, the reality is integrity is not taught. It is caught. You know, you and I know children don't do what you tell them to do. They do what you do. So if you want them to read, read. If you want them to do math, do math. If you want them to pray, pray. And believe you me, if you want them to plonk themselves in front of the TV, you know exactly what to do. And finally, when you talk about the fear of the Lord, for me, this is a situation where we can discuss biblical extracts that speak into this season of our lives with our families and our children. Uh, for my family, what we have done is we've been discussing First Chronicles 12, 32 about the men of Ishka who understood the signs of the times and knew what they had to do for Israel. And it's very interesting, even my 10 year old understands that at some point, the cloud will move. The Corona cloud is going to move. Who are going to be the men of Reuben who went in front of the tribes and the men of Ishka who advised them and behind them is, is the tribe of Zebulun who were able to resource that? What is that going to be in our context? So Bible is actually coming alive as we are sitting at home and just riding this pandemic through. And so those are practical ways we've been able to take advantage of that. Any family anywhere in the world can do that in their context and under their circumstances. And so this is it. So for us, it's warm. Regards from Kenya, the land straddled across the equator. And as Pumba and Timon would say, Hakuna Matata. Thank you very much. Knut, thank you very much for that, uh, that practical uh, and inspiring address. We appreciate it greatly. Um, just a, a further welcome to all that are uh, with us on uh, on our uh, Zoom call and our webinar today. I uh, just scroll through the uh, participant lists and certainly recognize people from from a number of different continents, uh, uh, from uh, from Dubai, from the Philippines, from Africa, from uh, a number of places around the world. So thank you uh, for joining us, and it's great to see great friends. Uh, with us on the call, and Knut, uh, really appreciate your your inspiring message. Uh, our last panelist for today is our good friend, my good friend Tim Chin, uh, who comes to us from uh, from Taiwan. Uh, Tim is uh, is involved as a board member of the Global Home Education Exchange Council and is the uh, the the prime shaker and mover and organizer of the uh, Taiwan Homeschool Advocates. Uh, Tim is a homeschool dad and. Uh, founder of the organization in Taiwan. Uh, Tim and his has family have been very involved in getting the message out and he's appeared in the media in Taiwan, Hong Kong and China and many other places as well. Uh, Tim, uh, we're great to have you uh, with us. We know that there's been great progress in Taiwan uh, over the years uh, in, uh, in recognizing the homeschooling uh, uh, and uh, having it in your constitution. Uh, Tim, uh, as I said, uh, is, a, is a homeschool dad and uh, has, uh, has been great to, to be, have Tim involved in the global conference and the global board. And uh, although we uh, don't have the opportunity to get together in person, Tim, welcome here. And we look forward to uh, your sharing with us uh, what's going on in Asia. And uh, very appropriately, you've got a background behind you there that. Uh, is a whole lot more interesting than mine. And uh, so Tim, welcome from Taiwan and uh, greetings. 
Thank you, very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Euro. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, as you can see from my background, um, this is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I can, I'm going to share, uh, okay, I was going to share my own presentation, but it's, yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, if I can have the video back to me, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and without further ado, let's get started. Um, Right, so uh, there you cannot have a homeschool presentation without a family photo, and uh, so here's my. And as you can see, we are a homeschool family from around the world because uh, right now we are shelter in place in Taiwan, in Japan, and in USA. And uh, my wife is from Poland originally. So Jiro had made a, a lot of. Uh, made a very comprehensive uh, uh, introduction to, to my experience. So I will get straight on to the presentation. And uh, uh, I would like to mention that I've been participating in Global Home Education Conference since 2000. And uh, uh, what, yeah, there's one more, there's 2012, but I've been on the board since 2016. So uh, it's been a, a great pleasure to be uh, working alongside with uh, Jiro and Mike and, and all the wonderful people around the world. And uh, so, uh, where is Taiwan? And uh, for those of you who are uh, looking at this world map, uh, Taiwan is on the right hand side where you see there's a bubble. And uh, I, uh, I use a US reference uh, to give us an idea. You know, Taiwan has a population uh, larger than Florida. Uh, but it's only a little bigger than Maryland. So as you can imagine, there's uh, going to be a lot of people packed in a very, very small area. And uh, we are very close to China. We are only about 100 miles uh, from the Chinese coast. And uh, it's an island. Uh, and, uh, but so far, we have uh, very uh, little uh, uh, coronavirus uh, cases. There are 480 cases and uh, only six uh, fatalities. So uh, we've been, we had our first case in January 15. So we had our 100 days of Corona already. And uh, the school has been going on continuously, uh, except for the winter break and over the Chinese New Year an extra two weeks to dis disinfect the school. So school is going on, business is going on as usual, but there is a lot of pressure uh, still parents are very anxious because next month is a big exam month. And we see in Europe, uh, the French and the British and also in the US, all the major exams are closed. And, but we are still going on with the exam that is going to have a, over 200,000 students gathering together. So it's going to be a big challenge to us. And uh, homeschool in Taiwan has, uh, has tried to balance uh, the students' rights and the education choice, um, because the uh, from the initial the uh, the re regulation are actually initiated by the parents, and uh, we have uh, we also involve the students to uh, to participate in the uh, advocating their own rights, and uh, the law actually guarantee the homeschool parents and homeschool group can participate in the discussion and the decision making. So the, four, the, the committees are made up at least two fifths of uh, homeschool uh, parents and uh, groups. And homeschool students can participate in all school uh, activities, including sports. And we, yes, we do get paid uh, to go to, home, to, to homeschool. And if you're a high school homeschooler, you get uh, 2250 US dollar a year as a tuition subsidy you can spend anywhere you like and uh, if you have a special need uh, kids at home uh, the government actually have to spun, uh, support you in terms of assessment teaching and administration and there are special admin channel to go to college so homeschool students get protected all their uh, rights and as a result of that, the number of homeschooling, uh, homeschooler has quadrupled in the past 80 years. And uh, since I participated in the first GHEC in 2012, um, although the number is still relatively small, it's three in a thousand compared to like 2% in the US. But we see a, a big growth continue in this trend and exponentially. 
And uh, the, I would like to take a moment to explain why uh, Taiwan homeschooling can be so successful. A very important framework is what we call multi-stakeholder partnership. Uh, we don't see uh, homeschooling just as a parental right or just as students try to exert their independence, nor do we see it as a fight uh, against the uh, state terror. Uh, we see more of a multi-stakeholder partnership in ways that uh, we all work together as a partner. So the government is, is providing education support to students through either parents or school and very often in combination of both. So the student benefits, either the education is received from the parents or the school. And the government gets the credit for having a, a regulation that is able to provide education through any way the student uh, feel the best for them. And sometimes the student will decide, well, I, I'm going to learn uh, independently by myself without school or parents, which is also fine. And it happens a lot in the high school. And so and that's why the government give money directly to the students and not to the parents. And they say, here's a 22,050 US dollar, 2,200, sorry, I wish it was 22,000, uh, 2,250 US dollar a year. And you can spend it on anything you like uh, to enrich yourself. So students uh, spend it on uh, whether taking courses or investing on a new uh, computer and all sports equipment or anything uh, they feel uh, most fit for their education. And the government gets uh, recognized uh, and they also include parents and the schools in their decision making. And now they also include students in the decision making on how to move forward. And, and I would like to, uh, that will be my uh, uh, final, present, uh, final slide. And uh, I'm happy to answer any question later on. And uh, since I'm the last person, I will stop right here and let um, Gerald take it back. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we'd now like to, uh, to first of all, uh, open the floor for questions. And the, the process for questions would be that there is a, a question and answer tab uh, in Zoom. Uh, that uh, that you could type your questions into, and uh, um, we'd ask you to, to do that. You could also do it in chat, but let's use the question and answer one just so we could do it all in one place. And um, uh, we'll uh, we'll go through the questions. What I'll do is I'll I'll read them out and uh, and ask uh, ask uh, panelists to uh, to address them. Uh, first question is from Laura, and the question is: Are we seeing any promising developments from from countries? who have previously not legalized or not officially uh, legalized uh, homeschooling. And uh, Mike, I'm gonna, you probably have your finger on the pulse of, uh, of home education legalities around the world. Uh, any comments on that, uh, on that question? Uh, thanks, yeah, me? thanks, Gerald. Tim, everyone, wow, what an amazing panel. I mean, just so inspiring and encouraging and uh, I cannot wait to uh, get this Zoom recording out to everybody else in the world. I'm so sorry to those of you who had trouble with the Facebook Live uh, feed. It was very spotty, and I know that's very uh, frustrating and discouraging. So um, we're gonna we're gonna get this up. Um, what, amazing, uh, encouraging things. I mean, yeah, lots of encouraging things happening all around the world, uh, legally and otherwise. I mean, homeschooling is growing. I mean, 1.5 billion <laughs> children are now suddenly schooling at home, you can call it crisis schooling. And I think Carrie did such a great job of, of articulating that, you know, this is not authentic, you know, homeschooling, which is characterized by you know, freedom and lack of stress, right? Well, there's some stress in homeschooling, but still, uh, anyway. But, uh, but, you know, lots of people are, are homeschooling even before coronavirus, the numbers were going up all over the world. And um, from a legalization perspective, uh, we are seeing positive developments in more places than not. Um, there are a few places that continue uh, to notorious to be notorious persecutors or repressors of homeschooling, places like Germany um, and Sweden, and but at Cuba, right? Uh, you know, places where you would expect well, Germany and Cuba in the same sentence is like, what? What do you mean, Germany and Cuba? Uh, that should be an embarrassment to the Germans, um, and uh, I don't know what the Cubans would think about that, but but anyway. 
but even in Germany, there have been some positive developments. Um, there have been a few court cases where judges have refused to follow the German federal Supreme Court's basic pronouncement that homeschooling is not good. You know, Germany is a federal republic. And so the states, you know, like in the United States or in uh, control and, and in Canada and other federal republics control education policy. Uh, and so the federal, federal court in Germany said it's okay for states to ban homeschooling, uh, especially if it's done for religious or philosophical reasons. That should make people like wonder what's up with Germany. Uh, but in the last few years, couple of years, there have been cases where children have been, um, uh, you know, had trouble, the families have had trouble from the youth welfare authorities in Germany and courts have looked at these situations and said, you know, we're not gonna follow that even though homeschooling is not legal, it's not endangering this particular child. So that's a really big deal, even though it's just small numbers um, in Germany. So there is, there is some movement there, uh, you know, places like Russia, Brazil, South Africa, uh, Mexico, we are seeing homeschooling growing very fast. And as it's growing, it's getting legal recognition. Most other countries are probably, you know, where homeschooling has not been sort of mainstream for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, are about where the United States was about 30 years ago, where there is a growing movement. It's not legally recognized in, a lot, in, in, in those countries and they're having to push for that. So lots happening, um, definitely an increase in legalization, legal recognition of homeschooling. Very exciting. Hey, let me just take this opportunity, Gerald, to launch a poll, if I could, since I got the floor here. Sure. Where are you from? What continent are you from? Let's find out where everybody's from. I had to put the Americas together because they only let me do four, four answers. <laughs> All right. And we have 10 seconds left. Oh, I guess we can just keep on going. That's great. Well, this is really cool. Look at all the African participants. That's fantastic. And actually really spread out all across the world. Well, thank you. We're, we're delighted. Gerald, back over to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. I just in scrolling through the participants, Mike, I, uh, I counted at least 15 different countries that, uh, that I just recognize people that I know. So uh, great, great participation. A couple of questions uh, while we're, while we're uh, going through here. First of all, Knut, a question from Maria. Do you have a, a blog or a website? And if you do, maybe you could just chat, or just type that into the, into the chat window so that uh, people can follow, uh, follow you. Um, I, question uh, about, uh, from uh, from Jill at uh, at Home Life Academy, how many countries public schools are considered staying closed in the fall? Do we have any idea about that? Um, I think at this point, there's certainly countries that are considering it, uh, but I don't know that anybody's made any decisions at this point that uh, that we're aware of. But if uh, if somebody has an answer to that, uh, uh, just uh, put up your hand and we can uh, we can uh, address that. Um, uh, what resources are available for special needs homeschooling globally and how can we connect with families who find themselves in need of resources? That question is from, from Cami Arn. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just ask, uh, ask Erica, do you have any comments on that from your experience in, in, uh, in Italy or Europe in terms of special needs? And then I'll also ask, ask Mike to comment on that because I know there's certainly resources that HSLDA US has. Yes, there has been an increase. Yes, there has been an increase in uh, homeschooling families with children with special needs, uh, even because we've been seeing how uh, unfortunately the schools are not always able to cater to the needs of these children. Actually, what we have been noticing and the feedback we got from our, the members of our group of our organization is that uh, it happens sometimes that uh, the teachers, the school teachers are the first ones who advise these families to seek information on homeschooling, which is quite incredible because now we're, we're, we're um, witnessing where the system is saying, you know, maybe your child would thrive in a better way in a with a personalized curriculum and in a home environment. Um, so there is the will and there's the interest. Unfortunately, the government does not offer so much support. I was, uh, I was so, so happy to hear, Tim, how the situation is in Taiwan. And it's amazing here in Italy. Homeschoolers, unfortunately, are not much considered, you know, and um, 
there, there's no support whatsoever. And there is a lot of bias. And uh, when we get to the yearly examination, unfortunately, the schools think that, you know, it's not all of them, of course, and the situation is improving as we go on and as um, people are informed. And, and certainly after the COVID-19 emergency, I believe uh, homeschoolers will be seen under a different light, a more positive one, but still, we do get um, that feedback that we are the different ones still. And homeschooling has been, um, let's say, popularized uh, in the last, what, 10 years maybe, even though it has always been part of the Italian constitution. Um, it's only that at the beginning, you know, just few families did it and, you know, for specific reasons. And now it's, um, it's something that the media covers every now and then and people are more aware of it. We just need to catch up. I just feel that we need to catch up. Uh, to get back to the question, we do provide um, specific um, information and support for families with children with special needs. Uh, it's not well structured, I must admit. It's not well organized. Maybe we can um, receive some help as well to help us support the, these families in a better way. Thanks, Erica. Mike, any comments? Yeah, very briefly, Gerald, thank you. And I'd like to ask Deb and Carrie to be prepared because I'm going to hand it over to Carrie first sure. and then over to Deb uh, to comment on this. Um, you know, special children with special needs in, in the United States is probably the fastest growing segment of homeschooling. In the United States, we have very formal procedures in public schools for dealing with children who have special needs. There is a very, federal law that requires all states um, to follow very rigid procedures and they're supposed to provide what's called a free and appropriate public education that is tailored to each child's individual need. Now, you know, even as much as they try to do that, there's no better place than in a home environment with a loving mom or loving parent, loving guardian, one-on-one um, -on -one with that child, addressing that child's specific needs and then providing for that child's therapies, whether they're physical or occupational or speech or health related because special needs can be physical, they can be mental, they can be emotional. Um, and, and this kind of touches on one issue I just want to briefly touch on because there's been a few comments on this and the comments is about the connection between homeschoolers and public education. It can be a little bit of a touchy subject. In some places like you just heard Erica talking about and, and Tim talking about how there is formal support for um, homeschoolers in their countries to, to a degree. In the United States, there's about 30 of the 50 states that have some kind of law that requires schools to provide some level of services. In most cases, that's just extracurriculars, although in some states, maybe a third of the 30, they're required to provide access to curricular and co-curricular um, activities with, with more or less restrictions and policies at a local or state level. Um, it's also a little bit of a touchy subject for some homeschoolers because in the United States, we do have 2 million homeschooled children and some of those communities are very densely populated. So it's no problem if they don't have access to public school activities because they can just create their own leagues, their own community theaters, their own co-op activities, and they can serve each other. I can understand how in a country where there are very small numbers of homeschoolers, like in Italy or in Taiwan, relatively small numbers, we're having that kind of public support um, would be helpful and looked for and expected and appreciated. So I think around the world, you have different views on that. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned about in the US is, you know, with public support, we're always concerned about the government imposing restrictions on us. We're very jealous of our freedom in the US. And we're like, we don't want anything to do with the government. Thank you very much. Just leave us alone. That's the, the majority. Although in some cases, not everybody agrees with that. So, but getting back to the point about special needs, um, you know, nothing better than a homeschool environment for that child who has those special needs with a loving parent, one-on-one, -on -one, deal, helping that child learn. And let me ask Carrie to jump in and talk about that as well. Thanks, Carrie. Sure. Thanks, Mike. I think uh, the other thing that parents may be discovering now, um, again, while we're social distanced, but also um, learning without schooling, is that some of the um, identified special needs that may have been labeled by schools as issues such as attention deficit disorder um, may be much less problematic in one's home. Uh, you know, there might be children who are taking medication so that they can concentrate when they're in school and now are not taking that medication when they're at home. And that might be um, something that parents can really look into a little bit more and start to question uh, Harvard researchers about a year and a half ago published 
an article, a research article in the New England Journal of Medicine, finding that, um, for example, in states in the United States where there is a September 1st kindergarten cutoff uh, for entry into kindergarten, children that were born in August um, and had just turned five were 30% more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than children who were born in September and were, were just about to turn six. So just that, that alone, I think, um, is a statistic that I think a lot of families should really consider, that some of these labels around special needs could be um, adjustment issues to schooling that are mismatched for childhood development. And maybe parents are getting a glimpse now of their children outside of that conventional classroom and realizing that some of these issues um, may not actually be ailments at all, but may be uh, a mismatch again in the kind of learning environment that their child was in. Deb, I'm gonna ask you to comment uh, next. Uh, I know that you lead a significant research development effort in home education, and uh, that's a great resource. Um, maybe you wanna tell us a little bit about what's coming up in, in the research area, but uh, specifically to address this question about special needs as well. Oh, yes, thanks, Gerald. Yes, I am chair of the research committee on the Global Home Education Exchange, and it's a growing, um, group of emerging scholars from around the world who are interested in or currently actively researching home education and we want to facilitate that. So one thing that we have started since we had to cancel our conference, uh, our live conference is we are starting a homeschool research interest group and uh, we'll convene for the first time um, at the end of this month if people are interested in letting researchers or scholars who might be interested in researching us know about this group. I'm going to put my uh, contact information in the chat box in just a moment so uh, folks we can follow up with that. Uh, and just to kind of uh, speak to parents who have special needs, children and parents in general, Here's some really empowering good news. Uh, after I finished homeschooling my kids, I completed a PhD in educational psychology. And I read all the research in education that we, the major findings of the past 75 years. And if we could summarize those findings, we'd summarize it this way. We're, our kids are designed for individualized instruction. And that's why uh, conventional, instruction causes so many problems for kids. It's just not what they were designed for. It doesn't really support optimal cognitive development. So whether you have a special needs child or not, individualized instruction is going to help that kid, um, you know, develop as a human being and develop as a scholar um, most readily because we're designed to uh, grow within the family unit. So that's what I add to that conversation. And I'll put my contact information in the chat right now then. Thanks, Gerald. Thanks. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that greatly. Um, I'm going to go to a question uh, that Bo, uh, Bowie from uh, South Africa asked. Uh, Bowie said that during the lockdown, as we've talked about here a lot on this call, there, was, there is an increase in home education as a means to continue with education while the schools are closed. When the lockdown ends, many children will not return to school uh, by the choice of parents. This uh, will have a significant financial impact on, on both private and public schools. Uh, his question is, can this lead to a backlash and increased pressures uh, to make home education more difficult around the world? I'm gonna ask Knute uh, to, uh, to, to address this question. Uh, Knut serves as an advisor to uh, to some uh, some elected officials. And uh, Knut, uh, what what do you think about this? And then I'll ask Tim if he can comment as well. Yes, um, there, are, there are three things I'd like to mention about that. Number one is all of us have been brought together by a common enemy. Uh, and and. Karin, Karin's husband, Linda Van Ustrom, he since went to be with the Lord. Uh, they came to speak in our homeschooling conference in 2014. And he told us that homeschoolers all over the world 
are like cats. Cats by nature are not hard animals. Okay. So you, no matter how good a job you do, you'll get one passing between your legs, one scratching your shoulders. That's their nature. The only thing that brings homeschoolers together is a common enemy. And so today, even as we speak like this, homeschoolers all over the world have come together because of the corona pandemic. And now even the government has come together with homeschoolers, unprecedented. Now, of course, once this is over uh, and reality starts uh, hitting uh, the ground. One thing that I see happening is there's going to be a lot more interest in homeschooling. Uh, of course, once government gets involved, government thinking is aggregation, it is exams, it is testing, which is not what homeschoolers are into. So what I would say is we will cross the bridge when we come to it. But the good thing is they will have tested and seen that it is good, and they will have seen that the homeschoolers were there pulling on the same side with government, which has never happened for the first time. And so that sets a very good platform for us to be able to engage with them. And now when they listen to us, they hear us because we are part of their solution. Uh, public schools, uh, private schools, I mean, schools by nature, it is systems thinking and so, uh, uh, I, I never worry too much about, about the, the, the schooling front. On government, uh, I'm, I'm more concerned because government policy is aggregated for all the students in any country. And, and from this, I'm going, I'm seeing, my crystal ball shows me a very good working relationship with homeschoolers after this season is over. Thank you, Knut. Uh, Tim, yeah. your experience, any comments? And then I'll go to Mike. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I, I think in the way that uh, we, Taiwan developed very differently. Um, 20, 22 years ago, it was illegal. And then at the beginning, it was a lot of struggle. And then then we, we codify it into a law and then suddenly people realize that it's a legal thing to, to do it. And, uh, and school, parents, students all, all come in, you know, fall in line and say, yeah, we should, we should make it possible because as long as the kids are learning, uh, what does it matter if it's learning at home or at school? So, you know, our experience has largely been very much uh, trying to get everybody on board and focus on learning rather than uh, who has the right or who, who is responsible for the learning and uh, just focus on bringing the best education to the kids. But uh, to, to get the law passed, it was very, very difficult. And, uh, and I want to thank um, HSLDA leadership as well as the GSGC uh, gave me a lot of guidance and help uh, in the most difficult time uh, years ago. And uh, so I'm here to pass on our experience to everybody around the world. Thanks, Tim. Mike, you had a comment. Uh, thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's a privilege for me uh, as the Director for Global Outreach at HSLDA to work with people like all of you, all the global leaders here. It's, you know, um, the only difference between the United States and other countries who are just kind of in the early stage of, of learning and growing with homeschooling is that we've been at it for about 40 or 50 years and we've just been through uh, all the things that, you know, you're going to go through. You know, what I see when I, I tra I've traveled around the world until, you know, I was not allowed to leave the country uh, two weeks ago. I was, this week or two weeks ago, I was supposed to be in Bulgaria. I had all these trips planned and all of a sudden, boom, 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 they felt like dominoes. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting back on an, an airplane. Uh, my kids probably and wife aren't so excited about that, but I'm looking forward to getting back out there to uh, to keep encouraging the growing homeschool movement. So it's a great honor to to work with people like you. Um, on this, uh, uh, you know, I think on the issue of backlash, um, we're seeing that in the United States. Um, we're seeing schools uh, saying things like, "No, you can't homeschool," or "We're going to suspend all instruction." and maybe that could be interpreted to include homeschooling. So, you know, there are 50 million children in the U.S. that are, uh, that go to school. 
roughly. And there are huge unions that, you know, they're dedicated to increasing the number of children and the number of teaching jobs. And so they, they're not gonna be happy in any country if homeschooling grows. And so you're going to see pressure from unions, from skeptical government officials, skeptical academics, like I was talking about this Harvard professor. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, her ideas are gonna gain a lot of traction They've been smacked down by so many people in the United States. I, I don't think a lot of people are going to take it very seriously. At least I hope not. Um, we'll certainly be ready to push back. But um, at the local level, at the state level, um, at the national level, there's a lot of money in education. And that's, you know, there are lobbyists for these organizations. They're very powerful. And so you got to be ready to watch out for that. Uh, so I do think that that could happen. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened in the United States in some places at the state level. And so that's one of the things that homeschool organizations need to be able to do is to advocate for their community at the legislative level, whether that's state or national. And so my encouragement to homeschool organizations and leaders is yes, we need to be reaching out now, encouraging people. That's our short term plan. And then long term, we need to be prepared to help those people make the conversion from you know, just trying out homeschooling in response to the coronavirus to then actually doing homeschooling and complying with the laws in their state or, or country, but then also being prepared for any policy responses that might be negative, even as we encourage positive change, positive policy response. There's going to be a legislative fight. It's coming. It's going to be money oriented and policy oriented. And so we need to be thinking about that. Mike, thank you, and uh, I uh, echo your uh, your comment just on the I think the quality of of the discussion, the questions, the presentations. A question from Anna Polina, um, who's from Colombia. Uh, in the countries that apply exams to homeschoolers, do they have any online tool to do it? Uh, she's thinking of her country, uh, where education her country authorities. Uh, that should they develop something like that to evaluate uh, the students while in confinement, and sh they're looking, uh, asking whether they could show an example of something that's already working somewhere. Um, maybe I'll just interject first of all that uh, what I would like to encourage everyone: uh, we do have a Facebook discussion group as part of the Global Home Education Exchange, and although we won't have an opportunity to address all of these questions here today, I, I would just encourage us to be sharing. Uh, these questions and uh, information that uh, that you have uh, as part of that uh, that Facebook discussion group uh, on an ongoing basis because I think it's uh, it's important to do that. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, if any of the panelists have uh, if their countries or the regions have experience uh, in online uh, testing. And Erica, I know that Italy. This is a big a big thing in uh, Italy, in Portugal, uh, but particularly in Italy. Um, what, what kinds of tools uh, do we have as homeschoolers uh, to be able to, uh, to address those tests and how could we share those together? So we have been monitoring the situation in order to advise homeschoolers on what the outcome is going to be regarding the yearly examination. And as I stated earlier, uh, there is so much confusion and the Minister of Education hasn't come out with guidelines and we are like four weeks, six weeks from the testing dates. Um, but what we have seen is that each uh, school has uh, a form of um, independent uh, way of organizing itself. And already now, some homeschoolers have been requested to send in and in a digital way. So something like a, a written a composition on different subjects. And this is what we are personally advising our homeschoolers to do right now. Even before that there are gu guidelines, I believe it would be right for the families to prepare something and offer it to the school. The school right now doesn't know exactly what to do. There are so many things that are challenging, uh, you know, and the homeschoolers could be the last ones on the list. So why not just move forward and you know, give an idea of a portfolio of, you know, a yearly work that the child can compose with the parent and offer that as a form of examination for this year that has been so challenging on so many levels for the family. Another thing that we noticed is that some schools are organizing um, 
Zoom meetings or Skype calls uh, to have uh, a short interview with the child, this, and with children as young as six, you know? And I don't know exactly how that is going to turn out at the, at the moment, but there have been schools requesting this form of, um, of testing. And I hope, I hope that it's going to, do, to be done in a, you know, equal way with all and in a just way, taking in consideration you know, the situation, uh, COVID-19 has impacted homeschoolers just like others. In Italy, I must say, a lot of people aren't happy uh, because of all the differences that we have amongst kids who are in school, in state schools, kids who are in private schools, and then again, all the home educating population. Uh, it's all different and it's hard to find your bearings when it's like this. But in any case, yes, this is what the two possibilities are, online interviews with the children and the one that I think is you know, the rightest at the moment is the one to prepare some sort of portfolio of work of the whole year and instruct the schools. I mean, let's make the first move. If the schools don't know what they're doing, let's, let's just offer this. This could be a good way to show what the homeschooler has done, you know, all those incredible things and, and have the, the teachers evaluated on that. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Deborah, uh, there's certainly been a lot of research and a lot of work done on uh, developing uh, various testing systems and, and support systems. I know that you run an online academy as well. Um, any, any comments on, on how homeschool leaders and organizations can position themselves to be able to be a, a support both to homeschoolers now and into the future? Um. I think, Gerald, we should think beyond COVID-19. I think we should think, uh, as Knut said, that um, homeschooling is really going to change. It's going to be positive. We've been legitimized in one fell swoop. Uh, there will certainly be pushback. Um, as far as testing, I don't know of anything offhand. I know a lot of test providers are now moving their testing administration to an online environment. I, I think it's something that homeschool leaders uh, around the world ought to make one of their tasks to uh, at least first identify a testing alternative, uh, which I think is preferable. I think portfolio evaluation or other forms are a better way of measuring student achievement. But if testing is uh, what you're faced with, that you should just make yourself a uh, room at the table. I think we need to uh, now not wait for them to tell us how they want to evaluate our, our children. I think armed with research, which is what we want to provide at GHEX, is that research that you can be armed with, is that you make room at, uh, at the table and say, hey, we're stakeholders too. If you are going to evaluate our kids through some kind of online testing or other uh, regulation, we, wanna, we need to be a part of the conversation. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Carrie, we uh, we are being attacked in various ways uh, with all of the information that's flying around on social media. The, the things that are 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 hitting us, and particularly now in the United States with this Harvard uh, meeting uh, review thing coming up in the in, in the next, uh, I think it's in June. Um, any thoughts on on how we can, as Deb says? Uh, look beyond COVID-19 to what's coming after us. Any thoughts? Right. I mean, I think I'll echo what the other panelists said that, I, you know, I'd be very surprised if we don't see an uptick in the number of families choosing schooling or some other kinds of alternative school after this. And I think as a result, there could be more pressure from um, opponents of educational freedom or opponents more specifically to try to, um, discredit homeschooling or criticize homeschooling. I think that this uh, upcoming Harvard conference co and also the, the recent Harvard Magazine article, um, I think were likely planned. Certainly the, the article itself probably was uh, in the editorial queue long before COVID-19, but I think uh, it is worth responding to. And of course, you know, I think Mike has, has said this as well. There's nothing um, preventing uh, Harvard or any group from organizing its own invitation only, you know, conference to discuss this. We just need to be prepared as leaders and advocates 
um, to respond to any possible increased uh, regulation proposals or policies that would limit homeschooling and education. Thank you, uh, thank you, Carrie. I'm not sure. I, I think I'm not sure whether I lost the feed, but uh, you're muted now. So, um, one of the uh, one of the suggestions uh, from Samira in uh, in Abu Dhabi is that we need to uh, need to have more discussions like this um, uh, with uh, with leaders, and we'd certainly appreciate your input uh, as to uh, either format or content. They you know follow up on the questions and uh, be able to to continue this this discussion and not have this be the the end of the discussion but rather the the start and the on of an ongoing discussion um i'm just uh, just looking here at uh, at at questions um that we've got uh, we've got remaining mike any comments from your perspective on things that you're seeing either in chat and having a little bit of a hard time following. Yeah, questions. sure. No, I think I think we've addressed most of the questions and I think it's, we're probably coming to the end. It's uh, been a great two hours, so we can probably wrap up. Uh, and I think, you know, the suggestion that we do this again is uh, is right on. We're going to do it. Uh, we probably won't use the Facebook Live. We'll just do it on Zoom. <laughs> or maybe we'll try Facebook Live, but we'll invite everybody to the Zoom conference. And, if you know, if anybody does Facebook Live and it works great. Um, Anyway, I just I wanted to piggyback on what Carrie was saying about the Harvard situation. I did put a link into the uh, into the chat there to just one article, um, and I, I like this particular article. It is from a conservative perspective, but there are articles from all political views, uh, religious views um, regarding you know the Harvard thing. And as Carrie says, it was in the queue, uh, but it's it, it comes at a time <clears throat> when which just shows the lack of common sense and strategic thinking that some of these people have. I mean, with 1.5 billion kids suddenly schooling at home, it just doesn't seem like it's a good editorial decision to put out an article calling for a ban on homeschooling. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So <clears throat> anyway, but this in this conference was certainly getting a lot of attention. Uh, for those around the world who aren't familiar with it, it's not hard to find uh, information about this, but in a nutshell, uh, there are a number, uh, maybe a dozen or so law professors and a few academics in the United States who are, I would call them statist. Um, I'm not sure what they would call themselves. I guess, Carrie, maybe you know what they would call themselves, but uh, they're professors. Uh, they see homeschooling as a threat to democracy because they think that only public schools can properly socialize people. That's the argument of the German Supreme Court in banning homeschooling. Um, it is an extremely, uh, it's a splinter view uh, in the American academic community. I, I would venture to say that probably the majority of people in the academic community either don't care, they might look down on homeschooling. And a lot of them, because they have experience with homeschoolers in their college classes, probably say, maybe in an unguarded moment, yeah, homeschoolers are my best students. Um, which is what I hear a lot from professors uh, in universities. Um, but, uh, but anyway, they were going to have a conference at Harvard, the sole purpose of which was to talk about uh, how to regulate homeschooling more, make it harder for people to homeschool. And of course, they pointed out HSLDA, the big bad HSLDA, uh, as uh, you know, the ones responsible for ensuring that oh, 2 million kids a year are homeschooled. And we certainly don't mind being pointed out uh, as being the defenders of homeschool freedom. Uh, but I put a link in the box there. Uh, the conference was going to uh, happen in June, whether they still have it uh, because of the COVID-19 situation is, is a question. Um, if I were them, I'd quietly, I'd cancel it because of COVID-19 and then not reschedule it. Um, you know, but we'll see what they do. It'll be interesting. The article that uh, Carrie was referencing and it was in the Harvard Alumni Magazine. And it was really just a very, very brief summary of a law review article written by Elizabeth Bartholay, who is a Harvard law professor, and ironically, the head of their child advocacy program. I mean, if I was a kid, you know, you might say, with friends like these, who needs enemies? 
uh, because she basically argues in her article that it's dangerous to let kids be with their parents too much. And that's why she doesn't like homeschooling. Uh, and that's just cutting through about 50 pages of very interesting, very inflammatory, and very inaccurate and not data supported accusations, allegations, and smears against homeschooling uh, families. So if you want to know what elite academics in America, and probably their opinion is, is mirrored in, uh, in some places in other countries as well, just go and read this Harvard Alumni Magazine article and then go read Elizabeth Bartholay's um, law review article, which was published in the Arizona Law Review, and, and you'll get a, a absolute um, all you need for a lifetime of, of garbage, frankly. Um, Carrie, comment. Well, and I responded to that article. I'm a Harvard alumna. Um, education researcher and obviously a homeschooling mom in Cambridge, just down the, from Harvard's office. Uh, so I read in my latest article at FEE or um, to these claims, it was just such a one-sided, um, inaccurate portrayal of homeschooling. And I really kind of called them out. I mean, if Harvard Magazine um, prides itself with a tradition of editorial excellence, and this was far from uh, responsible journalism. So it was really, I think, um, you know, easy to pick apart a lot of the, um, a lot of trying to, uh, in that was really just a caricature and not at all reflective of homeschooling uh, in, in the United States and globally. Thank you, uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, thank you all. Um, appreciate uh, appreciate all of your uh, input and participation, Carrie, Tim, Erica, Mike, Knutz, Deborah, uh, and Minister Gertsen, who has left us. Uh, your participation is so valuable. I want to thank the uh, uh, over sixty uh, participants that uh, that were here as part of the um, part of the workshop and the panel. Uh, we really appreciate all of your participation and we will be doing this again. I, I find this um, event, uh, this time to be amazing. The exposure that we've talked about uh, of home education. Uh, what, what stands out in my mind is the opportunity that we have before us uh, with the number of families that are involved in this thing that we all well know uh, and love as home education to be able to share some of the joy with them. It's interesting how the biggest question that we get asked is what about socialization? And the reality is that these 1.5 billion people have an understanding that the reality of home education is all about socialization. And this uh, pandemic has addressed this question in a way that we could never imagine and will have impacts, I think, for generations to come. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this will play out and how we can use this opportunity. So I wanna, on behalf of home educators around the world, I wanna thank each one of our panelists for their participation uh, for the time uh, today and uh, look forward to our continued discussions as we go forward from this, from this time. And I would just encourage you to access the GHEX uh, Facebook page uh, and the opportunities that are there for discussion on an ongoing basis. So thank you all. And uh, this, will, this recording will be posted and circulated uh, so that you can share it uh, to the home educators, the parents, uh, those 1.5 billion people. I think many of them would be interested in some of the parts of what, what we've talked about here today. And they certainly be interested in seeing uh, Knut's smiling face. So thank you all for, for your enthusiastic enthusiastic encouragement of parents around the world. Thank you all and bless you. Bye for now. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye guys.